Greetings everyone, this is Teddy Wilson, Seekers of Yahweh Ministries, Shabbat Shalom. Uh, we're going to be recording uh, teaching out of uh, the Torah portion for this week. And uh, before we get started, let's sound the shofar and pray in and dive into a, a study of Yahweh's Word together. Hallelujah. If everybody would grab your scriptures, open up, get your pens and paper ready. We're going to be conducting a couple of Hebrew word studies. Uh, also, we're going to be looking at Deuteronomy chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, and, and that's what we'll gather uh, everything that we're going to be studying this evening. And before we get started, let's go ahead and pray in. Hallelujah. Father, we give you praise. And we thank you so much for your Sabbath. We bless you. We baruch you, Father. We thank you for the knowledge and the wisdom and the understanding that you give us, your people. We thank you for the redemption, for the blood that was shed, for the giving of your Ruach. We ask for your guidance and ask that you would be with us as we study your word and that you would enlighten us, Father, and show us the deep things in your beautiful language concerning your word. Bring fresh revelations to these words that we will study, Father. Open the minds and hearts of every one who will view and touch the lips of me, your servant, to bring forth your message and let it be your words, Father, and not my own, so that you can be exalted. Hallelujah. And we pray this all in the name of your Son, Yahshua, our Messiah. Hallelujah. All right. So everybody, uh, grab your scriptures and open up to Deuteronomy or Debarim, chapter 8. <clears throat> we'll be reading verses 1 through 5. Guard to do every command which Yahweh command, which I command you today, that you might live. That's one of the words that we're going to be studying there, that you might live. And shall increase and go in and shall possess the land which Yahweh swore to your fathers. Now, first, what I want to do is point out right away that here we see the commands that were given and the land connected to this word live. What good are we to the inheritance and to the giving of Yahweh's word if we be dead? If we be dead and walking in the trespass of sin, which is doing anything contrary to Yahweh's word in his, his commandments, then the inheritance can't be possessed. So this word live that we're going, and we'll see that word used again, uh, is very critical for us to understand. Hallelujah. Verse 2, And you shall remember that Yahweh your Elohim led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. There's the other word we're going to be looking at. Humble. There seems to be many different doctrines today concerning this word humble uh, when looking at it from an English perspective. But please remember, the, the, the scriptures weren't originally written in English. And therefore, the English definition of that word humble or humbled uh, can be misleading. It We already have a preconceived idea of what that word means in the English because of uh, what we've been taught concerning it. In, in our native tongue, in the English. And then we'll be going over that definition in the English. But what we're going to do, and also remember, that even the modern Hebrew is clouded when you look up those definitions in the Strong's because the Strong's is full of abstract definitions. They don't come from the action root or concrete meaning of, uh, say, for instance, Jeff Benner's ancient biblical Hebrew lexicon, that is based upon the ancient hieroglyphics. Modern Hebrew is not biblical Hebrew. Hebrew, excuse me. The hieroglyphics and the Paleo Hebrew are. So we must take into consideration what type of uh, what type of changes have come to us over the years as these definitions became abstract rather than concrete. Tonight we're going to go back into that and you'll see the difference. 
to humble you, prove you, to know what is in your heart, whether you guard his command or not. So here we see that this word humble has something to do with Yahweh testing our hearts. Not how you should submit yourself to, to someone else. That's one of the things I want to point out right here. Um, but as we get, get into the definition in the Hebrew, you'll begin to see uh, a new texture to the meaning. Hallelujah. Verse 3, And he humbled you and let you suffer, for, suffer hunger and fed you with manna, which you did not know, nor did your fathers know. Now remember that definition for manna means what is it or what it is. They didn't know what this bread from heaven was. And I submit to you, that's why um, many of the Yahudim in the first century didn't know that Yahshua was him because they didn't know the word. And the ones that did receive the knowledge that he was the manna that was promised, that was given from the Shemaim, um, discarded him because they did not want the Pharisees um, to reject them and throw them out of the temple. They were like, what is it? Is this him? What is it? Who is it? And that's what the definition of manna is, if you look it up. You notice there in that verse it says, um, with manna that you did not know, nor did your fathers know. See, and that's what the, that's what the definition of manna is. What is it? They didn't know what it was. To make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes for, from the mouth of Yahweh. The words of our Redeemer should be echoing in everyone's ears at this point. Hallelujah. He directly quoted this. And for all of these, the, these New Testament believers that believe that there's no merit uh, in the Torah or the Law and the Prophets, in their faith today, all they need to do is believe in Yahshua. Yahshua was quoting these, these things verbatim. And we'll be, we'll be closing out there in the book of Matthew. After we get a better idea, after the Hebrew word study, get a better idea of what those words mean in Hebrew, then we'll be taking a deeper look at what he said in the Brit Hadashah New Testament. It's going to shed a whole new light on it. We're going to know the biblical definitions of, of the of the Hebrew language and the Hebrew mind thought when he spoke what he spoke. Verse 4, Your garments did not wear out on you, nor did your foot swell for these forty years. Thus you shall know in your heart that as a man disciplines his son, so Yahweh your Elohim disciplines you. What I want to do right off the bat is make some connections to this last, from this last verse into the Brit Hadashah. We need to make these connections. So first we'll be looking, uh, let's, let's, follow, let's follow these teachings into the Tanakh in the book of Tehillim or Psalms. We'll be going to chapter 94 there, so if you go there and get ready. We'll be reading verses 12 through 14. Then we're going to travel all the way down into the Brit Adashah and see the same teachings. And this is, the, this is what I'm submitting. That this is the teaching, the form of teaching that we are supposed to be receiving from behind the pulpits today. Scriptural teachings with biblical definitions coming from the ancient Paleo-Hebrew or Hieroglyphics. And we're not getting that. My, I was sharing with my mother earlier, um, we were talking about how there were 12 spies sent into the land. She was reading this not long ago, and, and she brought it up. And only 10, or excuse me, only 2 out of the 12 gave a good report. And I said, Mom, it's the same thing today. Yahweh is showing us something there. Uh, and I believe this, and I believe that if you do the research, the statistics may even be worse than they were then. 
But I submit to you that only two out of men on the face of this planet that are teaching out of this word are bringing it to you in truth. Those ten men brought an evil report back of falsehood. Yet Caleb and Yahushua came back and said, we need to go in there. Yahweh said that we can do it and we, we can do it. They gave only two of the ministers came back and said, it is what Yahweh said it is and we need to go in there now like he said to go. And the rest of the 12, the 10, gave a false report and pumped fear into the mass of people. And I submit to you, that is what is going on in the world today. Ten out of every twelve men that are bringing you this word are doing it in falsehood and pumping fear into the masses. Father, help us. Now, uh, so here we see in verse 5, Thus you, sh you shall know in your heart that a man disciplines his son, so Yahweh your Elohim disciplines you. And this is speaking about the 40 years that he had them roaming around out there because they listened to the evil report and did not go into the land like he said to do right after they went through the marriage covenant, the Ketuvah, at Mount Sinai. So let's see these same teachings going all the way into the Brit Hadashah. We'll go to uh, Psalms, or Tehillim, 94. Verses 12 through 14. Blessed is the man you discipline. Oh, yeah. And instruct out of your Torah to give him rest from the days of evil until the pit is dug for the wrong. Do you see how long the psalmist says that Yahweh's Torah was to bring men that believed in him rest from trials until the pit is dug. That's, that's that fiery furnace that everybody reads about in the book of Revelation. That the Torah and the discipline from it to his children would be in effect. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Until that day, and I say, and I submit to you that that is the last great day spoken about in Scripture. When everything will be consumed in the lake of fire. Anything in opposition to Yahweh and His commandments and His kingdom rules. What a glorious day that will be. Yahweh Shalom reestablished on this earth eternally. Verse 14, for Yahweh does not leave his people, nor does he forsake his inheritance. So if you are a child of Yahweh, and you are lined up to be in the inheritance, according to this verse, until the day that the un unruly are thrown in the pit, we will be directed and chastened by what is written in the Torah. Hallelujah. We need these instructions. We need this discipline. We're going to see why as this same topic is addressed in the Brit Hadashah. Let us go to the book of Hebrews, chapter 12. And here we're going to be reading verses 1 through 8. Blessed be Yahweh's name. See, us, us making these connections, um, everybody who, who views this online by DVD or whatever, um, the, these things will give you the tools to show people and to prove to, them, prove to them that Yahweh's word is eternal and has never been, even by the apostles, never been done away with. We need to have the ability to make these connections. That's what I'm trying to do is help everybody do this. 
Some of these things are basic, but as we get into the teachings, you guys know, as we get into the Hebrew, these, can, these things can get very, very valuable and in-depth. Hebrews, Ibram, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1 through verse 8. And let me lay the foundation here. In chapter 11, it's the faith chapter. And every individual that, that um, the writer of the book of Hebrews is using as an example for faith, biblical faith in the New Testament, he brings up a patriarch, male or female, he brings up many Old Testament people that we are supposed to use as an example and as, as a, uh, a model of how to walk, what to do, and what not to do. Everybody that he gives us an example of to walk by faith is from the Law and the Prophets, from the Torah. So then he starts off here, if they lived through that, this is what he says, we too, he begins off, we too then, having so great a cloud of witnesses all around us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily entangles us, and let us run with endurance the race set before us. You see what he's saying? Same race. It's the same race that all of the patriarchs ran. The Israelites didn't lose. They were corrected and rebuked, as we're going to see by this teaching. They were chastened. Yahweh chastens those who He loves. We're going to see that. Hallelujah. Looking to the princely leader and perfecter of our belief, Yahshua, who for the joy that is, was set before Him endured the stake, having despised the shame and set down at the right hand the power and authority of the throne of Elohim. For consider him who endured, endured such opposition from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and faint in your lives. We should always look, when times are rough, when you and your spouse are going through rough times, when there are disagreements, when there are times that you don't feel loved, when there are times that you feel alone, don't make a drastic decision on your own. Make a biblical decision. Endure. Endure. He endured even the bloodshed to save the bride. Let him be an example of how we should live our lives to the best of our ability. Yes, we have our shortcomings, but to the best of our ability, Yahshua is the best role model that a man, woman, or child could ever want in this life. For he was the walking, living word, the Torah, manifest in the flesh of Elohim. Verse 4, you have not resisted unto blood, striving against sin. And you have forgotten the appeal which speaks to you as sons. My son, do not despise the what? Discipline of Yahweh. Nor faint when you are reproved by him. For whom Yahweh loves, he disciplines, he chastens, and flogs every son whom he receives. Verse 7, if you endure this discipline, Elohim is treating you as a son. For what son is there whom a father does not discipline? These are, these are direct quotes from what we just read in the Torah portions. How anyone cannot see that it was the same household rules cover to cover in this book is beyond me. Verse 8, 
But if you are without discipline, if you do something contrary to the word and you're not disciplined for it, this is a sign of something that you have become illegitimate. If you've done something against his word and you think that the spirit has revealed to you that it's okay to do it and you get away with it, it is because of this reason. But if you are without discipline of which all have become shares, then you are illegitimate and not sons. Now that word son will probably be going over in the Torah portions here. It's got something to do with the Hebrew word ben, which has a total different definition concretely than the English word son that you will find in the Webster's. The Webster's definitions, for the most part, mainly have total different definitions than you'll find in this ancient biblical Hebrew lexicon. This is the purest form of of the word that I have been able to find. And the definitions in there give clarity to what was being said. It's up to us to say the traditional things that I've been taught that they, those words mean were just not concrete. They were, we, it changes us to have to redirect our thoughts many times concerning certain doctrines or feelings that we've had towards the word in many instances. Not in all cases, but in many instances. Here we see the same exact teaching in the book of Tehillim Psalms and Ibram Hebrews as we just read in the Torah portions. Now let's go back to Deuteronomy. Hallelujah, let's get more Torah. This is where we will start conducting the Hebrew word studies. All right. First, we'll be going over the word humble. Let's, and we'll see that uh, in verse 2 and 3, we see the word. Um, in the English, it's two different words. It's humble and humbled. But in the Hebrew, it's the same exact Hebrew word. So therefore, it has the same exact Hebrew word. Uh, uh, connections linguistically and definition. We'll be going into the Strong's first, and then I'll show you the difference as we back into the ancient hieroglyphics and the concrete definitions given there in that lexicon. We need them all. We need to study what what the English means. We need to understand what the uh, the Strong's has defined in the abstract definition, and we also need to look at the concrete before we can make a decision as to what exactly was coming from the mouth of Yahweh in his thoughts. Because this ancient biblical lexicon by Jeff Binner gives concrete definitions. It will give you the abstract word, but when it gives you the concrete word, it will also give the concrete definition of the Hebrew mindset versus a Hellenistic Greek mindset that we see in the Strong's many times. All right. So here's, here's that word behind me. Humble is number 6031 in the Hebrew, in your Strong's, and we're going to be looking that up. <clears throat> and here's what it looks like in the ancient hieroglyphics, where the paleo origins are, the concrete definitions of paleo are connected to each and every one of these hieroglyphics. This is the Hebrew language in its purest form. Therefore, those definitions are what renders to us what the scriptures actually mean. We've got to understand that. If you can't get past that, you might as well turn off this, this teaching and just go on believing what you believe. But we're going to take the opportunity tonight to use this word and 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 we'll be reading the English definition, like I said, and see the difference in the definitions. We must be willing to, to change our theologies many times. But uh, there are instances where 
the, the Strong's and, and an English definition will pretty much add up with the concrete definition and, and everything is okay there. But if we have the concrete definitions, which is the purest form, um, not lining up with the definition we see in the Strong's or the English, and you choose to, uh, to stick with those definitions other than the concrete, then you're in error. Because that's not what Yahweh was thinking when he had it written, when he spoke it, so on and so forth. So here we see that it's made up of the iron, the noon, and the hay. And I submit to you, just looking at those ancient hieroglyphics, this is what we're going to see in the research of this word. Somebody that's mentioned in these verses is going to be looking. That is an eye. That's why it's an iron. <laughs> Hallelujah. It looks like an eye. So it's going to be have some, and then we it's going to have something to do with Yahweh or somebody else looking or seeing something to look upon, to look down upon, or look up to. Okay, to be looking at something. And here's the next clue in the ancient hieroglyphics. We see that the noon is a seed. So I would say there's probably Yahweh going to be looking here on his seed, his children. You see that it, it starts paving just the understanding of what the ancient hieroglyphics mean. will start paving the way for what the definition is supposed to mean and who it's being directed to. Because abstractly, these thoughts could be geared toward, um, let's read the verse. Verse 2 in chapter 8 of Deuteronomy. And you shall remember that Yahweh your Elohim led you all the way these 40 years in the wilderness. So here we see that Yahweh was doing the leading. So this is Yahweh looking on the seed that was roaming, the children that were roaming around out in the wilderness. Why? Because he had chastised them. Because they believed the false report of the ten spies that bring back a, a false report and scared the masses of people into believing that they couldn't do what Yahweh said they could do. Then we see the letter Hey, which is the little man either beholding or receiving something. Um to look up to, which we're going to see that fits here, the rest of the verse here, to humble you, prove you. So here we see that Yahweh was the one that this verse, the way we read it in English, was doing the humbling. And we'll see what it actually means in the Hebrew. Okay? To prove you. See, they had to prove themselves after the disobedience. There was something to be proved by this seed, by these children. To know what is in your heart. He has to know that it's in your heart to do what his word says for us to do as his children. Or you will not go into the land. That's the whole picture here. That's why he chastises you to show you that you will be rebuked. And your disobedience will not only bring punishment upon you, but it will keep you from the promises that were given to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. It's that simple. And until they were able to behold, to see, and look upon that fact, they weren't going in. <laughs> Just those three little ancient hieroglyphics give us that. The I am, the noon, and the hay. Now, Anybody can write me or email me. Um, I'll put the email address right there at the bottom here of, of uh, this teaching. And I will forward you a link to where you can print out these ancient hieroglyphic definitions, meanings, the characters, and also what they picture. And it also has the modern Hebrew over here as well. Okay, so you can distinguish the difference between the two. When you look up in the uh, uh, Strong's Concordance, the Hebrew there, you'll see the difference in the definitions if you have this paper. So if you email me, 
and, and request it. I'll send you the link to where you can just download it and print it out, and you'll always have it there when, when we're doing these, these studies. So you know this just isn't Teddy Wilson's theology. I don't have theology. I believe that the ancient hieroglyphics gives us a definite description of what Yahweh meant when he said for Moshe or anyone else what he spoke to them to write for us to read. <clears throat> so, the ayin is the first letter there. The ayin, <clears throat> of course, is an eye. <clears throat> Excuse me. Shaped like an eye. And therefore, you know it's going to have something to do with seeing or viewing or something like of the sort. Its meaning is to watch, know, and to shade. <clears throat> now remember, <clears throat> Yahweh watching over these people during the 40 years in the desert is what shaded them. It was the cloud that covered them from the sun. So that's, that's in the definition here of him watching over them. So here we see that he was still protecting, still protecting them from being burned out in the desert. He still protected them from being burned even though they were being disciplined at that time. Okay, and the second letter is the noon. And the noon, of course, is a seed. This is a male seed, like a sperm cell. Okay, and that, that word, anytime you see, as we're going to see tonight, uh, whenever you see the word children, child, or, or something of the sort, or uh, children, you are going to see in the Hebrew word that Hebrew letter used. Because it's got to do with something that has come forth, has been called and set apart and sanctified by Yahweh as his own. Or it came forth from the loins of one of his sons. Or himself in the case of Yahshua. Ben. That word Ben. We're going to look into it. Okay. And it, uh, the meaning is to continue. Without the seed you can't continue. Without the seed life stops. Yahshua was the seed. The word is the seed. Yahshua was the word, and he is the seed that was planted to take away the sins of the world. You see how all this fits together? Okay? Now, it also means heir, and we are heirs in him. And it also has the meaning of son. Okay? And <clears throat> the third letter is the hay, and it's the little man either lifting his arms, giving praise, or beholding or receiving something from the Shemaim or heavens. It's a little man with his arms raised. And the meaning there in the ancient hieroglyphics is to look, to have something revealed, or to reveal something to someone else. And it also means to breathe, receiving the breath, the Ruach of Elohim. Okay? So, Having these definitions, now let's look at the Strong's. Just looking at the ancient hieroglyphics, we see the ayin. It means an eye to look upon something that seed children or a son or a daughter, the children, and it's got something to do with them receiving something. And I and I submit to you that in this verse they were receiving his discipline. It's not always good, something good. You're, you could re, be receiving a hand to the backside for uh, punishment from the Father. But they were receiving. That was a, one of the meanings here. To receive something. Okay? Now, if you, if you have a Strong's, grab it. We're going to be turning to number 6031 in the Hebrew. Number 6031 in the Hebrew is the Hebrew word anah. It's a 
primitive root. That means that this is the root word linguistically of many other words. It's identified with number 6030 through the idea of looking down. Now, who was doing the looking here? Now, remember, this is the word humble. Or browbeating. <clears throat> to depress. Literally or figuratively. In various applications. So this means to depress. It means browbeating. It also means to look down upon. So if we read that verse with just those, uh, those abstract definitions, it will reveal something to us here that the English doesn't. Verse 2 in chapter 8, And you shall remember that Yahweh your Elohim led you all the way these 40 years. He's going to make them remember something from this discipline that he was handing down. These 40 years in the wilderness to humble you. You see that? To humble you. What he's saying was, this word humble means that Yahweh was looking narrowly as we're going to see at them. In other words, you believed the, a, a false report over my word, and now I'm going to discipline you, and I'm going to be watching you these 40 years to see if you change your heart, and you believe in me, and my word. And know and understand that I speak truth. And when I tell you to do something, that we can do something, that it must be done, it can be done, and it will be done, and it will come to pass. Okay? So here we see that it has something to do with browbeating, like looking narrowly at someone, you know? See, this is the action base of the Hebrew language. To look down upon. See, there's that iron. So here we see that Yahweh was looking down on them narrowly, as we're going to see. Okay, and looking at them. Now, I'm going to read the word, the definition out of the Webster's for the word humble here. And we're going to see the difference in what that in what it what it uh, projects. Mm, need my glasses for that. <clears throat> The word humble is listed twice in, in the uh, Webster's. The first one says, not proud or haughty. That definition doesn't fit here. According to what we just read in the Hebrew, that definition doesn't fit. The second one there is not pretentious. The second word there, humble, is also has the verb humbled in it which is the next word that we're going to read, or in, uh, the word that's used in the next verse. To make humble, which is to say, to make not proud or haughty. To destroy the power or prestige of. See, and Yahweh wasn't doing that to these people. He wasn't destroying their prestige. These definitions don't fit underneath even the, the abstract of the Hebrew that we just read out of the Strong's. Yahweh was the one doing the browbeating here, looking intently at them while they roamed around to see if they had a change of heart and decided to listen to him. So the way that it's, the way that it's worded there in the English and the definition that we uh, know of in the English concerning the word humble doesn't really give us a clear picture as to what Yahweh actually meant here, what he was trying to convey. Now, we'll be going to... Now remember, the word humble and humbled is the same exact word in the Hebrew. Just because you see the ED in the English, don't let that English grammatic... The English grammatics there get you off track. It's the same Hebrew word in the Hebrew context. Okay. Now... This word in the ancient biblical lexicon that Jeff Benner has uh, produced, if you want to get one of these, 
contact me at the email address that I've listed there and and I'll give you the link on where you can get them they're they're inexpensive but these could be one of the most valuable sources of information that you could ever receive concerning the truth about Yahweh's word in my humble opinion okay you can find the definition for the word humble on page 212 in Jeff Benner's Hebrew Ancient Biblical Hebrew Lexicon. It's under number 1359, subsection HV. Under Ayan Noon Hay, and we're going to study this back to the two letter roots because this has been added. We're going to look at these two letter roots and it's going to reveal some things to us. But these three Hebrew characters together means this concretely in the Hebrew. Affliction. Remember the definition that we just re read out of the uh, Webster's? That's not what this ancient word or this word means in ancient biblical Hebrew. Two totally different definitions. This means affliction in ancient biblical Hebrew. So this would say in the wilderness when he afflicted them in their punishment to oppress another causing depression. That is the ancient biblical concrete definition of that word that everybody sees there, humble. And see, the English word humble, and even the Strong's, they don't give us that. It means afflict, to afflict. And that's what Yahweh was doing, was afflicting them those 40 years to give them direction, guidance, and to rebuke and correct them for the sin which they had committed by not going into the kingdom. To listening to the false report. Now, further, concretely, this word can mean depression. You find that on page 212. You can also see part of that definition on uh, page 213. Um, a furrow depression is formed between the eyes when watching intensely. See, Yahweh was the one that was doing that. So the way that we see that in the English, it was almost as if Yahweh was humbled. It can't work that way. What he was doing was um, a furrow depression is formed between the eyes when watching intensely. Yahweh was the one watching them intensely while he was afflicting them during those 40 years. The furrow may also be formed by concentration or depression. Now, we'll study this back even further to look at the deeper meaning of these. These are all family members. But if we go back to the two-letter root of that Hebrew word, this is where we can clarify what, what, what I'm trying to present. That it was Yahweh who was browbeating them, narrowing his eyes in on them, watching them, Watching his seed to see if they received the correction that he was handing down. <clears throat> Number 1359 is the ayin and the noon. That's the two-letter root of the word we just looked at. So by definition, the further you go back, the more clarity you'll see in what he was saying. The action root of that, those two letters, means to watch. Concretely, the eye. That's why it's the iron. Hallelujah. He is looking. On who? The seed. <clears throat> and here we see that it means all of these things toward affliction. The pictograph of the iron is a picture of the eye 
The seed is a picture of the seed representing continuance. So here we see that what, what he's conveying here, what, what the ancient hieroglyphics is showing, is that Yahweh was watching his seed to see if they would snap out of it and continue in his word in order that they could receive the inheritance. If they were going to receive his rebuke and his correction so that they would not become illegitimate. We see all of those definitions in the word, in the word study so far. Combined, these mean I of continuance. The nomadic agriculturalist carefully watches over his livestock and crops the wheat, the sheep, the seed, the lambs, by keeping a close eye on them. Clearly saying that this was Yahweh looking down on his people while he was afflicting them to see if they had a change of heart by receiving his correction. Now, having those biblical definitions, let's move on to verse 3. And he humbled you and let you suffer hunger and fed you with manna. So here we see that in during the time that Yahweh is looking upon you and during your time of testing and persecutions, that Yahweh is going to continue to feed you. He's going to have mercy on you while he's correcting you or, te or, or you're going through some test. Okay, but this in no way, shape, or form means that anybody other than you towards him must be humbled, receive uh, the, 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 the depression of the Father, the correction of the Father. When we're corrected by him, we, we slide into like this type of depression of spirit because we know we've done something wrong. That is clearly the picture when you look at the ancient biblical Hebrew here. And fed you with manna which you did not know, nor did your fathers know, to take you, to make you know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. Once again, during Yahshua's trying, when he was being tempted, or, or Satan tried to tempt him, what did he do? He fought him off with the word. He received the word of Yahweh, okay? And it strengthened him, and it got him through this time of trial. Same exact concept. Now, are we supposed to be meek towards others? Are we supposed to be passive at times when people don't believe? Of course. But that word humbled gives, uh, in the English gives a total different definition other than what we see in the ancient biblical Hebrew. Now, you, many of you can go get, get the book yourself and, and study this stuff, um, but it clearly gives a different definition than what we see in even the Strong's. All right. Now, the next word that we're going to be studying is the word live here. In verse 1, Guard to do every command which I command you today that you might live and shall increase and go in and shall possess the land of which Yahweh swore to your father. So here we see that living, this, this, we're going to look at the Hebrew word here that has to do with living and possessing the land. Okay, and it's connected to his commandments. Also, this word down here, is used in, in the verse we were just going over, where he says, uh, Know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. See that? The word live is there. So what is that telling us? When Yahshua, who was speaking Hebrew, said what he said to, to Satan, and we're going to close with those verses. We're going to have a different outlook of what he actually meant when we study this word. Okay? Yahshua spoke 
that Hebrew word that we're going to study right now for live. Many of you are going to be very surprised at the revelation that this gives us. Okay. I'm going to be turning you over to Brad's board as we go through this, this word. Okay. All right. So, the word live comes from the Hebrew word number 2421 in your Strong's. The Strong's Hebrew section of your concordance is number 2421. And we're, once again, we're going to be going back into Jeff Beer's ancient Hebrew lexicon so that we can get the concrete definition of the meaning of that word. Here you see the hay is present again, but it begins with the letter het, which is a tent wall. Okay, and the yod, which is the outstretched arm there, anciently. So here we see that it's going to have something to do with the house or a tent. We're, we're going to see it's got something to do with either strength or an outstretched arm or something being given or something being received. Or this can even be a closed hand, or which would represent uh, not giving something, something not coming forth from the hand of Yahweh. Because of disobedience, I might add. And here we see that, once again, the letter He is in this word. And that would be, of course, to behold, to look up. And we'll go over those, those meanings and the pictograph, what, what the picture means. The Het, okay, is a tent wall. And it has the meaning of outside. So that means you can either be outside the house or inside the house. And usually wherever you see uh, verses that concern stuff like that, being uh, kicked out of the house, um, not going into the land or coming out of the land, you're going to see the letter het somewhere in that verse um, in one of the words. That rule always applies. Um, it can also mean to divide. A house divided, you see? See these, these different types of uh, things that it can, be, it can represent. And it can also mean half. In other words, it can also be in Hebrew words that mean that something has been split. Like even the rock that, that was split when the children of Israel were given water at Mount Sinai. More than likely, somewhere in there in the, in the Hebrew, you're going to see that. It's got something to do with splitting, the splitting of a nation, the splitting of people, so on and so forth. Okay? Then the letter He, once again, um, is a man with his arms raised. Uh, to look, to reveal or have revealed, or to breathe. And we know that to breathe, to get a freshness of air from Yahweh, hallelujah, is a good thing now and again. Because if you stop breathing... That means you stop living. And breathing or living is always connected to the word, as we just seen in that verse. Hallelujah. All right. So, that word live. Okay, we're going to look up in the Strong's. which is number 2421. Number 2421 in the Strong's Concordance is this Hebrew word. This is the ancient hieroglyphics, and it is the Hebrew word chaya. Chaya. And it is a primitive root. And it is also linguistically a linguistic cognate, which means a family cognate. Of it's, it's, uh, these are a family of letters that make up also the Hebrew word number 2331, which is the uh, Hebrew word for uh, Hava, which is Eve's name in Hebrew. And we're going to see why.
It means to live. <clears throat> Whether liter literally or figuratively, causative to revive. Okay, which if it's linguistically connected, this Hebrew word is linguistically connected to the Hebrew name for Eve, Hava, to live. Now we're going to see why. We're going to see some very, very, very uh, intriguing things as we go back into the book of Genesis here. All right. Before we do, we're going to go over these Hebrew letters, the definition. All right. This Hebrew word, number 2421, can be found in the ancient biblical Hebrew lexicon by Jeff Benner <clears throat> on page 122 of that book. The het yod hey is the Hebrew word hai, which means, we just read, can mean life. <clears throat> Here, it means sustenance. These Hebrew letters, anciently combined, mean sustenance. Abstractly, they mean life. <clears throat> the definition there is the revival of life from food, or other necessity. Now, looking at the two letter root, taking the hay away. Remember, this is how you always study back to the earliest form of the word. <clears throat> will always give you more biblical clarity. The two letter root is the het and the yod. That is number 1171 on page 122 of that lexicon. Listen to this. The action meaning of those two Hebrew letters means live. Concretely, stomach. And abstractly, it means life. So here we see that it has something to do with the stomach. What takes place in the stomach? That is where your food is stored. I, and I also submit to you that this will bring whole new meanings to um, certain verses like Abraham's bosom. What was in Abraham? What did he consume? What was he living by? The commandments of Yahweh our Elohim. To be, Abra to be in Abraham's bosom means that you are doing the same thing. You are eating what he ate. <laughs> you are consuming what he consumed and therefore you are the seed. You're in the bosom of Abraham. All right? Moving on. It has something to do with stomach. And right away, knowing that this word is anciently hooked to number 2331 and 2330 and 32, I believe as well, um, which is the same Hebrew characters for Chava. Okay? Which is Eve. Very intriguing things we're about to, to learn here. Let's go to Genesis chapter 3. This has to do some, with something about life in the stomach. Ancient biblical Hebrew says that this has something to do with stomach. Genesis chapter 3, we'll begin at 15. Remember we've seen the seed, <laughs> the outstretched arm of Yahweh, the head, the tent, the house, the house, the seed. You see the picture here? All right, beginning of verse 15 in chapter 3 of Bereshit. 
And I put enmity, this is Yahweh giving his judgment for what had taken place at the fall of man in, in the garden east of Eden. And I put enmity between you and the woman. Notice here, up to this point, and I, this, this contradicts many teachings out there, but it's a biblical fact. Eve was not named Eve yet. But Adam and everyone else on the scene of the crime knew what Yahweh meant because they understood these concepts about the language. They knew that something was going to take place in a woman's stomach. And it had to do with seed. And it had to do with the bruising of his head. And the hill, as we're going to see. Watch. And I put enmity between you and the woman and between your seed and her seed. Woman, and they knew that woman didn't carry the seed. The man plant the seed. So this, they knew that the seed, the noon, was going to, there was going to be a, a seed given to a woman that would bring forth salvation. She was, and then they knew where it came from. It had something to do with her stomach. Watch this. And between your seed and her seed, he shall crush your head, and you shall crush his heel. Many of you are seeing bruise there. To the woman he said, see, right when the woman received Yahweh's judgment, this caught Satan's ears. They understood. Watch this. I greatly increase your sorrow and your conception. Let me read that out of the, the word of Yahweh. Unto the woman he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. They knew that it had something to do with the stomach. It had something to do with the redeeming of life. It was the plan of Yahweh revealed. In other words, Yahweh even revealed it to Hasatan and said, there's nothing you can do about it. You think you've done something? All you've done is sealed your own fate. Trying to destroy my seed, my plan. My kingdom. And I'll, I'll, I'll show you why. I, I'm, there's probably a few questions arising in a few of your minds, but as we're going to see, give me a moment to explain. Uh, in sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now, how do we know that it's got something to do with the seed? It's because he was speaking Hebrew here, and that word children. I submit to you that, that let, me, let me go ahead and paint the picture here. That the plan of the population of the earth of Adam and Eve was dramatically different in Yahweh's original plan of their being fruitful and multiplying on the earth. But because of this sin, the plan was going to, to go ahead and take place, but now it was going to happen in a different way. And it would be in a way that causes the woman sorrow because of the pain that she goes through in childbearing. See, bring fruitful and, multi and multiplying the earth in the beginning, I believe, was a total different plan. It did not, would not produce any pain for the woman. It would not make her be sorrowful at all. But because of the sin, a new plan was implemented, and now women have to go through this childbearing to populate the earth in sorrow, in pain. And, they, and, and Hasatan and everybody there knew that it had something to do with the child that would be in her stomach, as we just read by definition, life, live, all of that. Just by the Hebrew characters, they, they knew that life, 
and to live had something to do with the stomach of this woman. And now childbearing is revealed. That's how they knew. That's how we can honestly look at these verses and say it was a, by these words that, that Satan knew that the Redeemer of the word, world uh, and, and, and the forgiveness of sin would come through the womb of a woman. Hallelujah. The word children here is number 1121 in the Hebrew. Guess what that word is? Ben. The Hebrew word Ben. Guess what? See the in, in here? It's got to do with the seed. <laughs> Starts with a bet. The bet has to do with the house or the tent. <laughs> Hallelujah. The house would be redeemed by the seed that would be given to the woman by Yahweh that would crush the head of the devil. And they knew, by definition, of the ancient biblical Hebrew lexicon here that we just read, they knew these, these concepts and these terms, these definitions, because that's what Yahweh meant when he spoke it. He knew that from the stomach of a woman, through the door of the world, which is the womb of a woman, would come the seed that would redeem the house. <laughs> Hallelujah. Having all of these concepts, all of these biblical definitions, let us move into and close at... Matthew chapter 4. This will give us a whole new look at what Yahshua was going through and what he meant when he spoke here. Matthew chapter 4, verses 1 through 4. Then Yahshua was led up by the Ruach into the wilderness. What did we start this study off with in the Torah? They had been wandering around out in the wilderness for 40 years, right? Yahshua had been fasting for how long? 40 days and 40 nights, a day per year. To be what? Tried. What were the children of Israel uh, having done to them? They were being tried. They couldn't... They didn't pass the test whenever Yahweh sent in the spies and they came back. They rejected the truth that the land was theirs and that they could conquer everything in their path. And they were sent out into the, into the wilderness for 40 years until they received their correction during, while they were being tried. And Yahweh was looking narrow upon, upon them. Okay, that's where we see the English word humbled. Yahweh was, was browbeating them, looking narrowly upon them and watching them to see if they would receive this correction. And Yahshua is going through the same thing here to overcome our shortcomings for us in His sight. So that when we are in Him, hallelujah, we are conquerors. We are no longer shortcomers. Yahshua did it. If we walk according to the word as we see here, every word of it, then we are Messiah-like and we have overcame the temptations of which our patriarchs and the forefathers, most of them for the most part, failed to do when they were going into the kingdom. It says he was hungry. And the trier came and said to him, If you are the son of Elohim, command that these stones become bread. He knew he was hungry. He was tempting him with food. Just like many of the brethren out there are being tempted with the eating of, of unclean foods. What happened to Eve? Why did it all start? She was tempted with something she should not consume. 
Verse 4. But he answering said, It has been written. Where? In the Torah portions that we just read. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of Yahweh. Here we see the seed that would redeem the house was using the same word that we just read in the Torah portions, the same, a, a, a quote from the Torah to fend in fend off the enemy and to secure the inheritance of the land and us living and life eternal in the kingdom reign. Hallelujah. Praise His name. He has given us life. We can breathe again. He's worthy of all praise, honor, and glory. Hallelujah. Well, I hope that uh, everybody has received something that can help them uh, in their own walk. And thank you so much for tuning in. It's such an honor to be able to come before you and bring the word of Yahweh. I thank you for all of the emails you've been sending uh, concerning the PowerPoints. If anybody wants the PowerPoints, um, once again, go to the uh, uh, website or, or my email address and... and uh, uh, Request it. They are available. I have many of you have been coming and asking me or have been sending me requests wanting to know if they're available. As of tonight, I have them all ready to be uh, converted to DVDs. And if you wish to, uh, to get, get them, contact me either by the phone number or the email address and we can make arrangements for you to do so. Let us go ahead and pray. Heavenly Father, we give you praise and we say Shabbat Shalom. We thank you for your word. We thank you for the life you've given us. We thank you for your beautiful language that helps us to understand what you mean, what you've said in the law and the prophets. We give you praise. We thank you, Yahshua, for the price you paid. We thank you for the understanding and the wisdom and the knowledge and the desire and the passion that you place in our heart and our mind. And we give you praise, praying all of this in the name of your Son, Yahshua, our Messiah. Hallelujah. Well, everybody, once again, I hope you enjoyed everything. Shabbat Shalom, and until next time, Baruch Hashem. Testing, testing. I will not fall down, I will stand my ground.